in preparation for a financial campaign in a particular church, a pastor decided that he would offer a four-week study for the children to help them understand what this giving idea was all about. And so he decided he would select a passage of scripture from the Apostle Paul, 2 Corinthians at verse 7 in the chapter 9. And the verse was this, each of you should give what you have decided on in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Well, that was a pretty good assignment for them to memorize that verse as a part of their experience together. On the final Sunday, parents came to hear what their students had been listening to, their children had experienced as the pastor had led this class, and he gave a brief overview of what they'd been doing and the exercises and, and how he was trying to help them understand the place of money in their lives. And, and finally, he called to the youngsters and said, now, would someone like to share our memory verse? Well, one boy was so enthusiastic, he was waving and going up on his toes to trying to get the pastor's attention. And so he called on him, and he came forward. And with a smile and a, and a clear, confident voice, he said, we, we learned this verse from Paul's letter to the corn fans uh, about giving. Uh, and the verse goes like this. Everybody should give what's in his heart, not repulsively or under convulsion. Because God loves a tearful giver. Well, he got, he got some of it right. God does love a cheerful giver. As part of your annual financial stewardship effort, of course, Gay asked me to come to kind of plant some seeds with you to kind of help you think about how important what you'll be doing next week is for the life of this church. Now, I will confess to you that financial campaigns are probably the most challenging times in the life of any church, especially for preachers, because the topic of money is one that most people don't want to hear when they come to church. No doubt many who come to a church on a commitment Sunday or one that's preparing for it would rather hear a sermon on any other topic than money. After all, most people kind of consider money matters to be private matters. And maybe so. But how we choose to use our money are expressions of our faith. And what we value the most is represented by what we use our money to acquire. Now think about that. Think about it particularly in the context of who you are as a Christian. And so as Christians, we, we must address money matters and raise some, some basic questions. And so that's what I want us to do together to think about as you prepare for your commitment Sunday. Let's, let's think about money matters from a Christian perspective. Well, it may not be a popular subject, but I, I think I'm in good company by choosing to address this topic today. As you probably know, Jesus spoke uh, to his followers quite a lot about money and possessions. In fact, many, in fact, I believe you might even say the majority of his parables in some way connected with money or possessions rather than faith and prayer. I find that to be rather interesting. And he did that because he knew something about human nature. He spoke to his followers about money and possessions as it related to God's kingdom. And he spoke so much about it because he knew that the greatest obstacles to overcome for us humans was that of greed and selfish desire. Now, we're fed by that, by the consumer-oriented society in which we live. Bigger is always better. 
Oh, you need this. It's newer and it does something better than what you have in the old. And so we're constantly being enticed to spend money on things. Things maybe that will improve our lives but make us happier. The whole concept of buying possessions often is motivated by people searching for happiness. Only discover in the end that it doesn't happen that way. Money matters. As we think about that idea of how we use our resources, our financial gifts and the financial spending, the possessions that we acquire, I want us to keep in mind some of the scriptures that help kind of set the stage for what we really need to be thinking about. There are several personal stories about money. Money was a big part, as you will recall, of the story of Zacchaeus. You remember Zacchaeus? Who was Zacchaeus? He was that little guy. He went up a what? He went up a tree and because he wanted to see Jesus. But what was his occupation? He was a tax collector, but he was a rotten scoundrel too. Because he just decided he would tax people whatever he wanted. There was a certain amount required by the Roman government that he was to turn in, but he filled his pockets. Interestingly enough, in that one story about Zacchaeus, he was so interested in knowing more about this Jesus that he'd heard about. And he climbs up this tree and Jesus spots him up there. And then you know the rest of the story? Oh, he was spotted by Jesus. And he told him, he said, Zacchaeus, come down. Today I want to dine in your house. And somehow or another there's this gap. We have no idea what happened. Except transformation took place in Zacchaeus' life. Something Jesus may have said, something Jesus may have done. Somehow or another, we end up with a story with Zacchaeus saying, Well, Lord, half of what I give, I'm going to give, I have, I will give to the poor. And if, I, if I've wronged anybody, I'm going to return it. Friends, I don't know what, I, what you would call it other than a transformed life. That's just one of the more powerful stories that we find there. You remember the story of the rich young man who asked a question about being a part of the kingdom, how might I find eternal life, and then Jesus realized what was blocking him from understanding what God's kingdom was about because he had these great possessions. And what did Jesus say to him? He said, give it away. Give it away. Then come follow me. Why did he say that? Because that was the obstacle. That's what was keeping him from developing a relationship with God. He didn't know how to use his money in connection to a faith that he desired. Sometimes that's true of some of us. So we need to look at some of these scriptures and learn from them and to discover what, what the scriptures are trying to say through real people that Jesus met and whose lives were transformed. And let us hope and pray that in some small way, this may be a day of transformation for us to rethink where we are as stewards. Now, one of the most powerful stories that absolutely blows your mind is the story of the widow. I'm so moved, so touched, so much wanting to express her love toward Jesus and what Jesus was saying about God's kingdom. That is, it came her time to go and drop an offering in the plate there in the temple. She reached into her little purse and saw how many coins? A hundred? Fifty? How many? Two. Two coins. That's all. In comparison to today, it would have been worth maybe a penny apiece. And somehow, she didn't give half, they'd keep half. Somehow, she gave it all. Now, I, I cannot wrap my head around that. That sense of commitment and dedication 
and sacrifice, can you? But here are examples of what God does through Christ to touch people and transform them in ways that they need to be transformed to become more faithful Christian stewards and disciples of Christ. I recall this story and others of how Jesus explained to his disciples that it was not the gift and the amount that was really important. It was what motivated it. It was what was coming from the heart that prompted the giver to give. God doesn't measure what we place in the offering plate by the terms of its value. God measures the gift and offering by our motivation. Because that says something about how we are connected in a meaningful way to the Christ of faith. Can you imagine Jesus saying to Zacchaeus, that shrewd tax collector we talked about a little while ago, well, I, I, know, I know you've taken more than you should and you've lined your own pockets to gain personal wealth, but, that, but that's okay, you know, that, that, just don't do it anymore. Just kind of go a little easy on folk. Well, I don't think that was in the conversation. Or saying to that rich young man, I, I, I don't want to offend you, but your money might be getting in the way of your relationship with God. So if you want to have one, here's what you need to do, of course. Well, so many stories relating to giving. So many people's lives that come forward and through scriptures that indicate that life is about learning how to give lovingly and sacrificially for the good of others. If we think we've got this business of being a Christian all figured out and hadn't thought about the fact that unless we are trying to figure out how to make someone else's life better than it is, if we're not more concerned about those who are the downcast, if we're not concerned about the people who go to bed tonight hungry, then we haven't figured out what it means to be Christian. Now, I'm not making this stuff up. It's in the scriptures. You want to know what Jesus spent his time doing? I just told you. Stewardship is also, of course, about our time and our efforts, our outreached hands, as well as also money that makes a difference, that is transformed in acts of love and kindness in Christ's name. Now, I, I grew up not, well, I guess it was quite far. It was in the Wyth District. Anybody know where Wyth is? Well, good. Hi, neighbors, former neighbors. Um, I grew up in Wyth, and I went to Hampton High School. Uh, forgive me for that, but I had no choice. I'm a crabber, and I stick with it. Um, but I went to church at Grace Methodist Church in Newport News, over on Huntington Avenue. That's where I grew up, and that's where I learned to give, through my parents. My parents would say to me, as we go to church, you've got to put some money in the offering plate. I didn't understand why, but I did it. And then it got to the point where they said, now here's your allowance. And you're going to have to give a part of that to the church. Well, I wasn't real sure about that, but I said, well, okay, if you think so. So I, I remember in those days, I think the earliest amount that I remember, son, I want you to make note of this, for my weekly allowance was a quarter. A quarter, but I do remember putting a nickel in every time. So I went through the whole cycle of trying to figure this out as a child growing up until finally I became a young adult and I established this pattern of giving and I continued to give even when I decided to leave the shipyard and go prepare for ministry and I went off to college and seminary being married, money tight, but we still gave because it was what Christians do. Through my discernment of money matters in the church, I, I came to develop that discipline as a faith response to a God who had blessed my life. That's why we give, friends. 
That's why we give it. You know what? We can never outgive God. But we can give too little. We can never give too much. And as a church takes those resources and tries to address issues in Christ's name, we're multiplying the work of Christ fourfold. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, offered three simple guidelines about money in his day. Some of you may have heard this. He said, earn all you can. I think it was a part of a sermon. Save all you can and give all you can. And it has been said when he preached that sermon, some gentleman in the back was overheard saying, he's gone and ruined a good sermon. <laughs> but he didn't really, because that was the thrust of the sermon. How does it all ultimately come together? Wesley, on the other hand, if we were to learn from his example of how God transformed his life in Christ, in his first ministry role earned 30 pounds. I don't know how that would translate into in his day, but that was his annual pay. He learned to live on 28 for the necessities of life. And he gave away the other two pounds to people in need. The next year, according, these are statistics that come out of his diary, his records that he kept. Next year, he earned 60 pounds. And he continued to live on the 28 pounds, and then he gave away 32. It was 90 pounds the following year. You see where I'm going with the story? According to his records, he continued to live on the 28 and gave away the rest all of his life. What he kept was just enough for the bare necessities for himself. And he gave us the rest to those who needed the most. I think that's a magnificent reminder of one who had dedicated his complete life to God and can still offer it examples. Now, I'm not saying all of us need to figure out how to do that in these trying times and high expense and cost of living, but I am convinced that most of us can refigure how much we are giving how much we're giving for our own joys, pleasures, and satisfactions, and maybe figuring out we're giving more than we are to relieve the hunger and address needs of those in our community. Money matters, and what we do with it is vitally important. A few years ago, I, I led a capital funds campaign. Oh, my goodness. But she said I could preach as long as I want uh, today. I, I hope you don't mind, but uh, I, 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 I got a lot to say, and I, just bear with me just another 20 minutes, and I'll be done. <laughs> um, I, I led this capital funds campaign for a church up on Richmond District a few years back, and it was a rather extensive process. It went on for about three months in the church. And we finally get to a Sunday before the big commitment Sunday, and the leadership team gathers and they, they make their commitments before we have a big dinner celebration and, and challenge the rest of the congregation for their decisions the following Sunday. A part of that was a group that had developed a video. And it was a magnificent story that told the history of the church past, the present, the kind of things they were doing. It was well received. Highlight of the whole event. Food was good, but that really touched people's lives. When it was over, and we were breaking up, and folks were going their separate ways, this little old, widow, little old widow lady came to me, and she said, Reverend Gillis, she said, I, I've got to tell you something. And she was a part of the leadership team earlier who had made her commitment. And that total had been announced to everybody to kind of inspire them to give. She said, you know, she said, in watching that video tonight, she said, God convicted me. She said, I want to change my pledge. What I put on the card earlier was just a token gift. I want to make a sacrifice 
for all that this church has come to mean to me and done in my journey. And so I'm going to double my pledge next Sunday. My friends, God is about the task of transformation. If we only are open and receptive to what God's trying to do in our lives. Are we listening as we think about this whole concept of money as it relates to our church and our lives? We need to think very clearly and courageously about the sub subject of money and possessions because they can be stumbling blocks. I do want to say I, I have learned all along many times that I've done consecration Sundays and capital campaigns and focusing on money that uh, the financial campaigns that we, we run is not just about raising funds to meet next year's budget. I talked to a pastor this past week who's done a wonderful job of sharing media and sermons around the whole concept of stewardship. And he said, you know, the interesting thing is that we never even showed anybody the budget. In fact, we haven't even developed a budget yet. We'll figure out how motivated people are to make the, the, for this church to make a difference in this community and our ministry to continue, and then we'll decide how we're going to spend it. What a bold thing to do. Maybe we need to become a little bolder than we have been. Because you see, ultimately, stewardship is about our relationship with God, and it's based on what God has done on our behalf. So giving becomes an act of worship. The final thing I want to say to you is that uh, I recall reading recently an article by George Bullock, who's a minister consultant with the Columbian Partnership, and he wrote about the challenges of finances in the church today, and actually reminded everyone that read his article that giving in the church is down, but the average is about one and a half to two percent of one's income. Then he asked the question, what would it take to motivate more faithful giving? And here's his answer. We need to cultivate a culture of generosity. Oh, that, ra that rang a bell for me. That rang a bell for, bell for the age in which I live and the age which we have been living over the last decade and when it's all about me. A culture of generosity as an appropriate faith respond to a generous God. Robert uh, Bishop, actually, Robert uh, Snazy wrote a book a few years back. Some of you may have even read it, called Five Practices of Fruitful Congregations. Anybody read that book? Well, I hope it helped you, and if your church hadn't engaged in some way in it, you may want to revisit it. But one of the things he, one of the practices he says is extravagant generosity. That's what he calls giving, and how we figure out how to do that. And he said it includes extraordinary sharing, willing sacrifice, joyous giving out of love of God and neighbor. Indeed, because God first gave and keeps on giving. Well, I'm trying to say to you that money matters. Money matters in our lives, of course, and in the church's life as well. Because money makes things possible in the church as well. So consider as you think about what you're going to do, what the, the gifts that you get in the offering do to make ministry happen through this church. The doors are open. You have pastoral services 24 hours a day. You have Christian education opportunities. You have groups that meet and become motivated to go out of the communities. I've been hearing some wonderful stories what the Methodist men have been up to and other groups in the church that are discovering that the real, real focus of when a church comes alive is when it has mission beyond its walls. I'm glad we have financial campaigns. I'm glad we have church budgets. And let me tell you why. Without them, we wouldn't be challenged to respond and grow in our giving. The budget is there as a guideline to help us determine, as we set one, what our priorities are, what we really think is important. Someone can say you can tell what kind of ministry is in the life of the church if you simply examine their budget and how much money they put toward what. 
And I think that's a pretty true statement. So here's some questions I want to close with and want you to think about this week. Consider making an appropriate decision about your giving on next Sunday, which will be Commitment Sunday. What priority does money have in my life? Why should I give to the church? How much should I give? How has God blessed me in my journey? Will what I decide to give be a token or represent a true sacrifice as a statement of faith? The Apostle Paul indeed pulls all of this together for us and when he wrote to the church at Corinth in that first century. Each of you, each of you, each of you, shall give an account of himself before God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found trustworthy. Each one must not do as he, well, each one must do as he has made up his mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. I think there may be one other question when you just decide to put that figure down and sign that card. Ask this personal question. Will God be pleased with my decision? Above all else, regardless of the amount, may your level of giving be an indication of your faith and a spiritual decision for the advancement of God's kingdom through Jesus Christ. Amen.